Yay, thanks so much for coming, everyone. This is our third of, uh, third poet, guest poet here at the Claremont Branch. And uh, we even are introducing a new title for the series, now that it's all series-like, uh, clearly meant. And uh, Joyce, Joyce E. Young is a regular here at the Claremont Branch, and so uh, I was happy to give her thrilled to be able to give a neighbor a venue whose good work deserves to be seen. Uh, I'm going to read you the bio on the back here so it may sound familiar to you. Uh, Joyce Young's poems have appeared most recently in River Babel and The New Poets of the American West. She has enjoyed residencies at Hedgebrook and Vermont Studio Center. She received a California Arts Council Artist in Communities grant and was a writer in residence at the Oakland Museum and Oakland Public Library through Writers On Site, a program of Poets and Writers, Inc. Her poetry collection, How It Happens, is forthcoming this fall from Pandemonium Press, which I believe is an Oakland Press. Uh, Berkeley. Oh, it's a Berkeley Press. <laughs> she is currently working on a novel, Parallel Journey. She works as a writing consultant at the John F. Kennedy University. Please welcome Joyce Young. Thank you. I have to get an official photographer here. <laughs> Thank you for coming out on this beach day. I call this a beach day. But I'm glad that you guys are here. Thank you so much. So I've been jumping around trying to figure out where to start. I always gather the poems. I know that they will come within the right time frame, but I'm never sure till I actually get here and see who's here um, exactly what I'm going to read first. Uh, I think I'm going to go with humor first. Um, and this is a persona that I created, and her name is Delilah. I am Delilah. Samson never existed. They made him up to subvert my power. I own myself, I have short hair, and a green beard. My castle is on Broadway in San Francisco. I am a poet of sorts. I am five foot eight when I stand on my head. I do that at least twice a day. I can't swim, but I can fly. I love to wear designer clothes and eat falafel. The opera soothes me. I dance every day. Prayer is only for the wicked. So I make sure I do it often. <laughs> okay, I'm going to switch to the manuscript, I think. Jumping around quite a bit. Oh, uh, yeah. So this poem actually was inspired by a fortune from a fortune cookie in a Chinese restaurant. And I'm not kidding. This was the fortune. <laughs> Confucius say, angel with wing, not so hot as angel with arms. <laughs> <That's exactly laughs> <what I said. Okay. laughs> so this is the poem that came out of that. It's important to have both wings and arms. Arms to reach for and hold what you desire. Wings to fly in the heavens with birds. Arms to pull yourself out of the mud. Wings to flutter while you think. Arms to swing your children around. Wings to fly over your pillows and bless them at night. Arms attached to hands that hold pens and write words. Wings that shed glittering scales of heavenly matter on every aspect of life. Wings that glisten in the light and dark of it all. Wings that remind you there are other planes, other states of mind, other ways of being. Let's get a little mystery in here. This is a short poem called Who Knows? Who knows what will come later? I cannot say. I open my arms wide, gather freesia, 
Hold them until their petals peel away. Drop lightly to my chest. Memory is sweet. Mm -hmm. And because I just walked here from home, which was really nice. <laughs> um, sometimes a trellis hands me jasmine scent first. Tiny white petals, mauve knobs, caress my eyes. Respite, simply laid before me. Yes. actually was inspired by a horse that I did see. I was in a house looking out on a path, and um, there was a horse that for some reason they were trying to get him to turn around and he wouldn't do it. So <laughs> um, out of that came Black Horse. <laughs> he danced down the path from the stables. He must have jumped the fence. He was so sure of himself, so sure he was supposed to join the riders. He was riderless, and his coat sh shone in the sunrise. I thought I saw him smile, but I'm not entirely sure. I could be making this up. I could have dreamed him. It was 6 a.m. and I had not been to bed. I tried to get back to work, but I could not take my eyes off of him. He was beautiful, young and well-developed, and he knew, he just knew. He walked onto the bridle path and stood facing the road. He waited for the approaching riders and wanted to be invited to join them on their trip over the mountain, but they told him to go back. The first rider pointed to the stables. He stood and looked at him. The other two riders stretched their arms out toward the stables, their mouths moving words I could not hear. He took a few steps backward and I felt such sorrow for him. They weren't going to let him go. I knew, had always known, but had hoped. He held his head high, turned, and danced his dance home. This poem I actually wrote for my dad. Um, and it's called Transformation. We turned Tonka truck, trucks upside down and marched plastic army men into and out of shoe boxes on a green linoleum floor cut and laid by my father's hands. We wrote our first books and drew pictures on old stationery with raised black letters. Lumber exchange terminal on every page. The paper consistently appeared, and with the innocent greed of children, we never questioned how. He fought in World War II, returned home to find work for his trained hands in New York, where everyone said opportunities were. But the Carpenters Union thought that his dark brown skin meant he shouldn't belong. They didn't care that the evidence of his skills was all over the house I grew up in. My dinner sat on a pink Formica counter, held up by darkly stained cabinets. Sliding doors met my knees as I ate. At my father's hands, a concrete basement became a wood paneled room. Scratched file cabinets and a piece of wood turned into my brother's desk. I wonder now if my father saw us as greedy. I think he was happy to give his children something he never had. That reminds me of my It does? Oh. <laughs> I love it when that happens. <laughs> Good memories. Yes. Okay. So actually, here's another relative who's popped up. My uncle. <laughs> One of my uncles. Um, and this uncle had a great sense of humor I mean, all the time. That's what I remember most about him was that he was making jokes and laughing and making us laugh. And uh, his nickname was Uncle Stack. His uh, given name was John. I can see you, lips parted, head tilted backwards, hat perched on your head. You're sitting in the most comfortable chair in your sister Ruth's house. She's been keeping that chair warm for you for over 20 years. 
The two of you are conjuring up more sly jokes, more nicknames for us, more belly laughs. If this is what I have to look forward to, I won't mind too much when my time comes. Um, okay. This is, um, people often think because of the name of the poem, Miss Virginia, that she was a beauty pageant winner, but she wasn't. She was actually my next door neighbor, and that's what we called her. Miss Virginia. She cried as she sat for hours on the back steps, rocking herself and rubbing her hands. When she did that, we knew she was going to Kings County again. Miss Virginia, what did she have to put up with? Hilton's greasy overalls, cans of beer, drunken belches, Bert's adolescent hormones that led him to women and little girls. How did she live with them? If she'd had another way, would she have danced? Carved something out of wood? Shaped a, li shaped a life for herself from clay? Would she have traveled to another town for respite? Spoken with ancestors who could have taken her by the hand? Held her up? What was Kings County? Oh, thank you for asking. Kings County was the county hospital. I grew up in Brooklyn, so it's the county hospital. It's like the, um, what's the one here? I guess with an H. It's like the island of Brooklyn. Yeah. Was she going to see family regularly? Or? No, she actually, it was hard for her to deal with life, so it would get to her to be too much for her, and they would have to admit her for a while. Oh. And then she'd come back home. She was our next door neighbor, really close. Um, but that happened periodically. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, and this um, poem, it was written for, or out of a memory of a childhood friend of me, I guess I would call her. And <laughs> they come from anywhere, you know. <laughs> and her name um, is Michelle. Michelle resembled her mom, except she was gangly, six feet tall, and her features were too big for her face. Her mom was pretty, Michelle was not. Her two top front two teeth had a narrow space between them and stuck out when she opened her mouth to speak. She talked a lot, but she always looked as if she wasn't sure she'd be believed. One summer, Sharon Strother's mom talked mine into letting me go to the camp she sent Sharon to every year. Michelle went too. Sharon, Michelle, and I were in the same bunkhouse because we were all 12. Michelle rode my ass for several days until I finally snapped. We were supposed to be taking naps or resting or something when she started up for the thousandth time. She called me fat. I lunged at her and everything tilted. We pulled hair, scratched, pushed, rolled onto bunks and onto the floor. My arms flew faster than I knew they could. I don't remember if it was Sharon or a counselor who broke up the fight. I was just glad I didn't have to hear Michelle's mouth anymore. <laughs> Later, as we walked to evening games, I was surprised when Sharon told me, you kicked her butt. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was just shocked. I mean, I don't, I didn't remember feeling like, I think Sharon was more, you know, proud and happy than I was. I was just still kind of in shock because the suddenness of my response, the fight yeah. itself being broken up, mm -mm. I just was kind of like still dazed that yeah. that happened. Okay. I mean, and I mean, I've always been tall, but she was so much taller than me. We were 12 years old, so I wasn't right. this tall then. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, you figure somebody that size is really going to get you, you know? Don't get a book by its cover. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Um, so this, of course, is going to date me, but it's called Social Life in the 70s. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> they all had the right music at home or on their car stereos. 
They had carved afros, suave lines, and manly voices. And they would stand in front of us at clubs and profile, never asking us to dance. <laughs> it was the hardworking brothers who took showers twice, gargled for 10 minutes, and dabbed on musk oil cologne, <laughs> the ones who were nervous and trying hard despite it. They were the ones who asked. They danced with us because they wanted to, and yet they also wanted to look as cool as the men with impassable faces, who turned to one side, then the next, <laughs> and posed in front of us, <laughs> drinks in their hands, suits sculpted to their 20 and 30 year old bodies, smug mouths set in time to the music. <laughs> images that I remember seeing as a little kid um, in Brooklyn. And my mom would go every couple of weeks to get her hair done. And so while she was doing that, I'd be walking outside looking around. And the place that she went to was on Fulton Street. So this is called Fulton Street Saturday afternoon. Steam from frying hair rises to ceiling. Red hot combs and curling irons hiss and spit. Aunt Minnie stands freckled, chatting, and smacking gum. Red lips, red hair, and hot chocolate skin. A train roars and rumbles below. All afternoon smells like Posner's bergamot. We escape to Mr. Harrison's candy store into the rhythm of white sparks flying from silver bus cables, air brakes, and yellow taxis. Jackie Wilson, Fats Domino and Chubby Checker wail real loud on the record store speaker. All shades of brown, tall, thin, short, and fat, auburn conks, stocking caps, shark skin pants, and wingtips pack the pavement on Fulton Street Saturday afternoon. <laughs> So I'm going to um, end with, what am I going to end with? <laughs> okay. A couple of really, really short pieces that um, I've, how do I say this? I'm part of what's called a poetry postcard circle, which is really kind of fun. So a group of poets, right now I think there are about 12 of us, um, are actually writing poems and sending them to one another on postcards. Um, so you have really a really limited amount of space to get your words in. So I have a few short ones <laughs> that um, I put on some of the postcards. And one of them I wrote to my left shoulder because it's been giving me trouble. <laughs> and so <laughs> Aaron's been helping with that, <laughs> definitely. Aaron is my yoga teacher. <laughs> um, so this is Dear Left Shoulder. Dear Left Shoulder, you need to be, your, your need to be close is painful. <laughs> My neck has no room to breathe, being squeezed in like that. Can you back down? Give us a little space. Asking kindly now. Very kindly. <laughs> um, and then another, well, there are two short ones, actually. I was watching the, the rebroadcast of the jazz series on PBS, the Ken Burns series. And so, um, in one of the episodes, they were talking about the time that Duke Ellington kind of came onto the scene. And there were two quotes that stood, with, stood out for me. One was from the Amsterdam News, and it was, Ellington has arrived. Watch his dust from now on. I was like, oh, oh nice. Oh. <laughs> and then another quote is from him, Duke Ellington himself. And he said, dissonance is our way of life in America. Um, and he was talking about, I think, the longer piece that he created, the theater piece. Um, so this is my postcard poem from that. Ellington, you couldn't catch him. Rips, barrier breaking cords, pomaded waves, raised brow, je ne sais quoi. Oh, he was so smooth. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know him, but <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the second piece was inspired by the dancers that they interviewed, some of whom were still alive. And, 
um, who they show dancing when they were younger, which was incredible. So I call this one Savoy Smooth. Um, honey spread on toast, feet shuffling, kicking up dust and flame. Forest fire, bonfire, no matter, all joy. And I'm going to close with Recipe for Hope, which is a, I guess in form is considered to be a list poem, but it's actually written in the form of a recipe. So first I'm going to read the ingredients and then I'll read the instructions. <laughs> So here are the ingredients. Um, five two-month-old babies. <laughs> I grab them. Come back here during the week. <laughs> um, six elders sitting and talking. Ten laughing kids. Two pregnant women almost to term. One year's worth of blank pages. Endless emotional support. One good friend and one small illusion about yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's what you're gonna do with all of that. <laughs> um, instructions. Take five two-month-old babies and kiss them one by one as you hold them and hug them gently and lovingly. Quietly smell each of them for three minutes while you perform this sacred act. Sit in a rocker beside six elders who have known each other for 30 years and listen. Pay attention to everything they say. Try to develop your tolerance for gossip, wisdom, and elders. <laughs> Hang out on the playground for one week with 10 laughing kids under the age of 12. Play whatever games they ask you to. Double dutch, tetherball, monkey bars. Never think that you don't have enough time to spend with them. Never think about time. Go on a shopping trip with two pregnant women. <laughs> Help them carry their bags and choose just the right food for those late night cravings. Be patient with their constant need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Imagine what it might be like to loan your body to another person rent free for nine months. <laughs> what would you have to do to reach such a large and selfless goal? Use metaphor when necessary to increase your understanding. Sit for 15 minutes every day looking at one year's worth of blank pages. Make this your meditation practice. Extend the emotional support you want for yourself to a loved one. Choose a friend, relative, pet, or neighbor to be the recipient of this gift. Remember that pets usually can't talk or send thank you cards. Allow one good friend to call you every day to see how you're feeling and take you to breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Accept the, the safety and peace of mind, restful sleep, and dream-filled nights that this friendship can bring. And the last instruction is to hold one small illusion about yourself and think about it for five minutes a day for five days. Then toss all of your illusions about yourself and get on with living your life. Thank you. And we're going to have a little interview. For, uh, if you can drag your little chair over, the bit, over a little closer, uh, I'll join you here. Are you going to sit on the key chair? Pull one over. <laughs> and, um, Not like it's a job interview, it's just a talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's an or, like, or interview for the job of ordinary life. <laughs> That's a good type of interview. That's yeah. what I like. Then <laughs> yeah, we're sort of fitting into the camera. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thanks a lot. My name is Glenn Ingersoll. Uh, I'm also a poet, and uh, I've worked in Try to give back to the poetry community by uh, um, you know, working in a, running a series or working in a magazine or you know spamming my poetry out to everybody. <laughs> um, what brought you to poetry, Joyce? Wow, um, I thought you might ask me that. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, what brought me to poetry was the body and and the physical body and. Um, 
at the time I was finishing up graduate school and um, I was in a program in which I was doing some somatic work um, as well. And then also I had just started to study martial arts. And I think that's really what kicked it. Um, and I would jot things down and normally, you know, I would write in a book, but I didn't think of myself as a writer. I would just write things in a book. And when I, when I would go to write, things started to come out in verse instead of in prose. So it was a surprise to me. I really had no idea. I always thought growing up my brother was the poet. Because he would when we were little, he would write poems, you know. I, you know, never really went to. Yeah. Uh, so you said somatic. That's, mm -hmm. that I'm not familiar with it. Ah, so um, I don't know if I could define it, but just of the body, you know, anything having to do with the body. So I call it somatic work, but basically it was uh, I had a mentor who um, he was a former dancer, a martial artist, um, and he he done some really imaginative things and inter interesting. He what he did was he looked at some of the basic similarities between different forms of movement, and he would uh, I would say prescribe for us practices that we should do. We'd had to go home and practice them, and then we'd have to write about them, um, and that was part of my program. And so I was doing that and. Then I also decided I wanted to, that's kind of what drew me to martial arts, so I started to study with another teacher. Um, and all of this was going on at the same time, and the first started to come up when I was back in school. Uh, college age? So. No, um, I was an older graduate student, so I was in my uh, early 30s when this happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I came late, I guess you could say. I don't know <laughs> if there is an earlier way, but yeah. You come to it. And, uh, and what are uh, the rewards, what are the distinctions for you between poetry and not poetry and uh, writing? Yeah. Whether you say poetry in prose uh -huh. or poetry in... Yeah. Well, I can talk about my process in, in terms of that. I was thinking about that earlier today, too. Um, not in anticipation of your question, but I think I was just thinking about it. But because I also write prose, when I'm writing prose, I can begin um, on a computer. I just go straight to the computer and start writing, or typing, whatever, both. But with poetry, I always start out longhand. And, and when it began, I, maybe because when I began, I started doing it longhand. But even now, you know, I have access to a computer, but I don't go there to begin any poems. I always start longhand. Yeah. Some of your poems are prose poems. So yes, they the, are. So you don't use the line. How do you um, how do you decide? Do you uh, decide beforehand? Or do you say you say oh, you you, are you writing in longhand and so uh, that's a poem or are you No, you know, oh that's a good one. I don't I don't know. You know, a lot of my um, although the the one the ones that I read today didn't come out of that experience, but when I was studying poetry, and I was, I worked with um, Kim Adonisio and Carol Dork, two really wonderful teachers. Uh, one of the things that would happen is, um, I, when I would feel the need, I guess, to tell a story or to begin to tell something and I needed to have longer lines in which to tell it, then I could see something really would be better as a prose poem. You know, to try to break it just really wouldn't work. Um, and then also, one of the things, I think it was Kim, one of the things that she said to us when she was talking about the form of prose poetry was that it's a really good form for dreams. If you're going to rely on some of your dream work and create poems out of that, um, prose poetry, that form really works well because it can hold a dream a lot better than breaking lines because, you know, our dreams don't kind of go like that. Or maybe they do, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or maybe it's the retelling, because the thing about a dream is um, I'm not writing the poem while I'm in the dream. You know, I'm writing it later, looking back at the dream. It might be that morning, sometimes it's not. Sometimes I don't remember them that closely together. I might be doing something else, and then an image or something pops up. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I might jot it down, I might not have time to. And at some point, if it's something that I really feel you know, I need to explore a little bit more, and exploration is a really big part of my process. Mm -hmm. Then it will end up on the page, and you know, I'll make that decision. You know, where to do line breaks, whether something seems to be more fluid, and then it becomes a prose poem. 
If it's not, then it becomes either free verse, or I might play with the form that I like. Yeah, I've seen that you do. You have tried different forms. Uh, and we have different forms in the little booklet. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the center one is uh, the pantoum. Yes. Like, uh -huh. I love pantoum. It's fun. Mm -hmm. What's a pantoum? <laughs> He's putting me on the spot now. So it's a poem, <laughs> a poetic form that I think originated they say in Persia, but some people also say in China. And it's got a form in that it kind of turns back on itself. Um, so there's a repetition in it. For me, it reminds me of a chant. And so that's one of the reasons I really like the form. Yeah. I can't do the, I can't tell you the, you know, that, but I can. Uh, yeah, I struggle. When I, when I work in forms, I have to um, kind of keep looking at the rules like, yeah, yeah. So I don't do it very often, but uh, it can be interesting. Mm -hmm. You can get effects that you wouldn't do otherwise, yeah. which can help you know, and change your other process. Your yeah. other, your, your it, yeah, it form. The interesting thing about form is, at first, when I began to learn more about form, um, I was thinking, oh God, I'm not the only man. It's just free verse for me. But um, one of the things that it was Kim said to us was, you know, form can actually push your writing in, in unexpected ways. So you, even though you feel like it might bind you, it can also set you free. So you want to play with it. At least she was like, at least try it, because everybody in the class is like this, you know. No, we don't want to go there. You know? Yeah. 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 Challenging yourself is. Uh, uh, people talk about. Uh, writing as possibly dangerous. <laughs> um, and you know, you're not hurting anybody by scratching on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Nobody reads it. Mm -hmm. Nobody is changed by it, affected by it. But if somebody does read it, they, uh, they can have all sorts of different reactions to it. Yeah. What are some reactions that you've had to your work? Um, I remember in one reading is a poem that I have um, called Advice, and I was writing it um, inspired by the 500th anniversary of Columbus discovering America, so that was my thing. And I read it at a, an event, and afterwards a woman came up to me and thanked me for reading it. She didn't, I don't think I gave a, any talk about it's, you know, what's motivated it. I just read the poem and she just said to me, thank you so much for reading that poem. You know, I've had some painful experiences and that poem represents some of them. And the poem kind of ends with um, something like, um, let me think here. What I'm saying in the poem is I'm talking to Columbus and his, and his men and I'm telling them that people live to the place where they're going, at the place where they're going, and that really they should ask to visit. They shouldn't assume that they can just jump in and or push their way in, really. And I say toward the end, um, pushing your way in is the worst thing you can do. Um, you know, wait to be invited. And if this does not happen, go home. That's how it ends. Mm. You know? And uh, she, you know, it reminded her of a personal experience. We didn't go into any more detail than that. But for me, you know, I mean, art has that that powerful ability. Um, you know, if I view a dance performance or if I'm viewing visual art, you know, I will take from it what resonates with me, but it doesn't mean that that is what the artist may have been thinking about or dealing with when that, the artist created the artwork, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, poetry is a variety of things. It's from, from narrative to more abstract, uh, like uh, stuff that we read that can make can make heads or tails of, but mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they just they have a music for their own. Uh, it's more surrealistic. Um, one of the poems included in the booklet was "Conjure Woman," uh -huh. um, and and I liked the the, ch how the changes in it, the, the work, the progress of it. Um, but I was also interested in it as an incantation, and you read one that was sort of a, a milder incantation to your to your uh, left shoulder, <laughs> your right shoulder, your left shoulder. <laughs> yeah. um, 
Um, <laughs> I, I like poets, I like the idea of, and I have used poems this way too, mm -hmm. uh, trying to conjure something. Mm -hmm. uh, you love poems? <laughs> <laughs> trying to conjure the lover who isn't there. Uh -huh. <laughs> what, sort of con what sort of thing, other things have you used your poems to conjure? Oh, let's see. I would say social change would be mm -hmm. one thing. Uh, I have a series of haiku that I wrote several years ago, and I was responding to a lot of the changes in funding to things like public transportation, education. I mean, I was just kind of, and so I decided to use haiku to kind of hit on each thing in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and that, it, you know, it helped me in that it was another way to, for me to get my voice out, as well as petitions and all the other things, you know, um, that I was doing and working with young people. But, um, yeah, I would say for things like that, uh, I don't know. I mean, conjuring is such an interesting word. You know, I would love to conjure world peace. You know, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> and I think maybe if enough of us get together, that can happen, you know. <laughs> Um, but I think, for me, things that I see that represent, from my view, injustice or imbalance, um, usually that's what I look at as things I want to conjure, you know, in my poems. You've worked as a teacher, and uh, with I, your your bio talks about uh, California poets in schools, mm -hmm. and uh, that was how I came to poetry as a uh, as a passion. Uh, you know, I'd written poems for mom up before that, Aww. but in high school, uh, we had a um, couple of poet teachers come and teach an after school poetry uh, class, and my first thought was, poetry, how boring. You know, do we really have to stay up for school to do it? Uh, but it was great. Uh, it turned out to uh, be a, kind of a, an open door, opening of the door for me, uh, to a, a freedom to use words uh, in ways that I didn't know I could or was allowed to. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about how you approach uh, yeah. your teaching of poetry? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. With poetry, I've taught both young people and also adults, and sometimes both at the same time. And um, mm -hmm. with adults, one of the things that I sometimes see is um, a, that they need more permission because they have in their head certain ideas about what poetry should look like and how it should sound and how it should be written and who should be writing it. I mean, sometimes they don't think that they have the right. And then with kids, um, one of the programs I've worked with in the past is through the Oakland Museum, and it's called Poetry Off the Page. And so I would go into classrooms with representations of artwork from the permanent collection and encourage first discussion. And the barrier to break through there is the kids believing that um, only the people who created the art had any right to speak about it, mm -hmm. you know, that their ideas about the art. So I had to do a lot around, you know, I just want to know what you think when you see this, or what does this remind you, those types of things. And then out of that, they would write poems, you know. Um, they could choose, we just kind of lined some of the, they were laminated posters up at the front of the room, and then let them go and, and have them, you know, write what they wanted to write, and they could choose one of the artworks. And then um, if they felt comfortable, no, no pressure, um, any of them could read some of what they'd written toward the end of the class. So I was in somebody else's class, you know, with this, but the the instructors were very supportive and really wanted their kids to have, their students to have, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And with California poets in the schools, um, I would say sky's the limit as to what, you know, the types of things that you can do with students. That was interesting too because the grade levels were so broad, you know, um, with that. and. We would joke, kind of, the teachers, not in a bad way, but we remember being there. I remember the first time I walked into one of the classrooms, and this I wasn't joking about. I remember looking, I think I was in a seventh grade class, and I looked at their faces and I just thought, oh God, I remember being there, this is so hard. You know, so how can I help them yeah. with yeah. what's so hard for them right now with what's going on, you know? 
Yeah, that mm -hmm. uh, poem about the twelve-year-old at camp. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How how strong our emotions are. Uh, how how hurtful. Uh, so few words can be. Yeah. Uh, and these, you know, the the interesting thing that I guess really occurred to me when I looked out at the sea of faces was they're not quite adults. They're not kids, little kids anymore. They're, you know, navigating this really rocky place in their lives. Um, and, and I can tell how hard it was for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I would like to encourage other people here to ask questions. Does uh, anyone have thoughts or questions to ask? I do. I love the poem with your father, mm -hmm. um, you. and with your father. And there was a little, I'm remembering, maybe I'm delusional, but you wrote with him, writing with Oh, him. it was my brother I was writing with. Okay. We'd sit on the floor with the paper. He, he would bring these old um, letterhead, you yeah. know, he'd bring boxes of them home, and my brother and I, and, and he'd just give them to us, and we'd sit on the floor, and we'd write and make books and draw pictures and That's staple so the pages together. Like how old were you? Wow. Uh, I don't ten or or less, probably yeah. younger than that. Yeah. That's such a yeah. Great visual. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Did your family yeah. have books at home? A lot of books. We did have books. We had a lot of books. We also had a lot of magazines. Like, my mom was the big magazine subscriber, and you know, she basically gave us the world by we had a National Geographic subscription. Mm -hmm. Years and years and years. So that Life magazine, which had mm -hmm. photographs, huge photographs, and I think contributed to my photography hobby, you know, uh, just, um, we had books too. I don't remember what all of them were. Well, we had some of the basic, alcohol and basic usual. They were used and given to us, but they were things like, um, you know, Child's Garden of Verses. Um, we had The Wizard of Oz, and then, there was a whole series of books, and I don't know if they were written by the person who actually wrote The Wizard of Oz or someone else, but there was a series of Oz books. And we yes, had those. well, uh, as an old Aussie myself, I can tell you a lot oh. about the Oz books. <laughs> yes, uh, L. Frank Baum wrote okay. several sequels, uh, and then yeah. after he died, the publisher contracted with another author to write several more. Oh. So uh, uh, we currently have in the collection uh -huh. the, the Baum books. Oh, okay. um, and um, some of the the others are s in and out of print, uh -huh. but you can often get them in your library loan. Uh -huh. the, the subsequent author uh, was very inventive and fun. She wasn't quite <laughs> as controlled as as uh, Baum. Oh. I don't know if you had those as well, but it sure really. might have been the age that when it, you might have been the age when it, they would have been available. Yeah, yeah um, and they were. We got them used, so you know I don't know. You know, um, I also remember we in school you could get books through Scholastic. Yeah, you know, yeah. so um, I remember you know getting as many books as I would be allowed to. You know, based on our finances, and then um, the books would end up lining the shelves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it seems that poetry comes a lot from memories. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it does, and memory and memory is so funny too because you, it's not what really happened necessarily. It's memory. Um, mm. It can come from memories. It can come memory from triggers. Yeah, mm -hmm. memories can definitely trigger it for me anyway. Um, conversations. As a matter of fact, a um, <laughs> one of my friends who's also a writer and posts quite a bit to, to Facebook uh, posted a few days ago about sitting in a cafe and overhearing, I don't remember what the conversation was, but he was like, what, what a weird conversation. And he kind of said, these people were talking about X, Y, Z. And I was like, you know, the fun thing about sitting in a cafe is that you really can learn a lot about what's in people's heads. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what's going on in their heads is they're you know, sitting there talking to friends or whatever, right. or on the phone. On the phone. Yeah. yeah, these days. Yeah. Are they talking to themselves? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or on the phone? Uh -huh. So it can, can come from, from things like that, too. You know? um, and then another comment you made was like, um, poet, well, uh, the arts. Mm -hmm. And you said that when a dancer is doing her or his dance, and that the audience might relate to 
to something totally different than what that mm -hmm. performer had in mind. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what art is all about? It mm -hmm. lifts us and makes us think and takes us away? I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think so. <laughs> I mean, that's, I think that's what it's all about. I love it. I mean, it, it's a little pause from reality. It's, it right. takes us to a very nice place. Mm -hmm. you know? It definitely has that power. It yeah. definitely has that power. Elevating us. You talked about it a little bit, but could you talk a little bit more about your process from changing from writing poetry to writing fiction? Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe mentally or No, it's fine, no. Um, it's interesting with that too because I didn't have any idea I'd start to write fiction, so you just, I, everything surprised me with this. And what I noticed, in retrospect, what I noticed happening was that my poems, even though they were free verse, not prose poems, uh, the lines started to get longer right before mm. this, this, what I thought was a free write, and I'll, I'll talk about how that started in a minute, but my lines started to get longer and I was kind of worried about that. It's like, <laughs> why, why is this happening? You know, that kind of thing. And then uh, this, I, this is when I was working with middle schoolers, so this was at least 10, 15 years ago. I um, took my students to a workshop, a Youth Speaks workshop, and I was sitting in the back of the room, and the person who was facilitated, facilitating rather, what he did, one of the exercises he did for them was to throw out images, and he wrote them on the board. And one of the images was a hot comb. And I thought, wow, hot comb. And I thought, well, I'm sitting here, I'll just start writing. And so I did, you know. And I suspected that what would come up for me would be a woman, because as a kid, I had my hair straightened using, my mom would do it using a hot comb. But what came up for me was a man, the image of a man who had been burned slightly here. He was singed because the, you know, he, he jerked. That was the thing. You had to sit still when this was being done. If you did not, you could get burned. You know? And I started with him, and I wrote something. And I you know, took it home, put it away, didn't think much about it. And then it started coming up for me to kind of look at it again. And I went back to it, and I continued to write about him. Who is this person? I wanted to know who he was. I got curious. And out of that, was the beginning of what's you know now a novel in progress. But I would have had no idea, you know, I, I had no idea I was going to begin something like that. And also, I thought at first he was the protagonist. Turns out he's not the protagonist. He's not the most interesting person. So you know, there are all these surprises with writing. And I think the kind of the thing that um, keeps me at it is that. I start one place, but I never know where I'm going to end up. So there's this mystery to it that's really quite wonderful. Not that I know what's going to end up in life either, but you know, <laughs> it's, it, I'm you know, it's me in the page or me in the computer, and um, I'm always curious about where it's going to take me, where I'm going next with you know what I'm working on. I I didn't quite understand the difference between prose and Free verse? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. yeah well, I'm just curious because yeah. I, I rarely write, uh -huh. but every now and then something is coming up, you know, mm -hmm. and I put it down mm -hmm. and it's kind of poetic. Uh -huh. And I sometimes I often think I should be writing a heck of a lot more uh -huh. for myself. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so what's the difference between these forms? Or, Briefly. Yeah. For, well, for me, when I say free verse, what I mean is, um, as opposed to a prose poem, which is more of a, it's a form, although it's a drawn out form with more prose writing, but it, for me, it doesn't go longer than a page. Okay. Some people, that might not be the case, I don't know. I mean, I've read other works. Free verse, I always think of, there are stanzas, or there are line breaks, and they're somewhat shorter. Now, okay. that's just my... That may not be the official definition, right. but that's how I how see, see it. it. Okay. Yeah, that's how I see it. Um, and then with prose, for me, I'm actually writing sentences. For me, they're sentences. Now, mm -hmm. again, somebody may say that that's not the case either because there are forms of, of fiction or other forms that would be prose that may not necessarily be full sentences. Maybe they're phrases. Mm -hmm. But that's how I distinguish it. But they're somewhat longer. You oh yeah, be much longer the prose. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah. For me now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing.
thing I, I would say is, um, I'm trying to think of the, the Poetry Foundation. No, it's the, is it the Academy of American Poets that has a poem a day? Uh, oh, sorry. No. <laughs> there's, there's something called yeah. Poem a Day. Yeah. And, and there, I there think there's some, uh, there's some yeah. sites that do like Poetry Daily. Yeah. So I would probably confuse them. But, okay. Uh, so if you search for, this is one way to kind of just see a variety of things. Okay. They're contemporary, and then on the weekends, it's, it's older, the older, ancient <laughs> uh, work. If you Google Poem a Day, you yeah. can sign up, and they will send you an email yeah. with the oh, Poem a Day. Okay. And the nice thing about it for the contemporary work is you get the poem, then you also get a sound cloud that you actually hear the poet reading his or her poem. Oh. And then you also get beneath that the poet's does a short statement about what prompted the poem. Mm -hmm. oh, so that's that kind of great. as well. So that's another thing to do. But I mean, you can also Google these forms, you know, and see what okay. is said about them oh, right. as well. I'm not an expert, totally. I just, yeah. Right. Uh, even those who claim that they're experts, I'm afraid, <laughs> things can change under their feet. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess what I say kind of comes from the people who taught me, you know. But there's such a wide, what I will say is there's such a wide variety in so many great areas in terms of what you call something in terms of its form nowadays. Mm -hmm. So things are not as set in stone mm -hmm. as one might okay. think. Yeah. yeah, one of the terms that I've been heard, heard bandied about these days is hybrid, it's hybrid yeah. writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a little unclear what hybrid writing is. Yeah, right. Yeah. They don't have electricity yet, or it's like uh, it's either it's either one thing or the other. By candlelight, yeah. 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 So, do you for prose and free verse? Do you is that always by hand? You say you're writing. It's the Usually? no. Um, the fiction, or I don't do it anymore, but I used to do some journalism. I would always do that straight on the computer. Right. And it's not like I thought about, oh, I'm gonna do it that way. That's just how my writing goes. Right. But if I'm writing poetry, I always start off longhand. Yeah. yeah. But that's just my peculiar process. People do all sorts of things. Do they? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you ever begin to write when you're in a very, very, very bad mood? And <laughs> And does the subsequent result of your session take the mood away or focus it to something? Oh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Yes, I do begin, have begun to write when I'm in a bad mood. Usually I'm pissed off about something. You know, I just, uh, just be honest, you know, yeah, whatever, some decision that's been made, something that's going on, something at work, you know. Um, I would say that it does in a sense because it helps my mind get unjangled, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Because when I'm really, you know, like, uh, like that, things are kind of like this in my mind. So it can help. That's not the only thing I do to, uh, yeah, to, how do I say this, to kind of, I'm trying to make sense of what it is that's going on a lot of times. You know, some decision's been made, somebody says something, you know, what was that, what was that about? You know, that kind of thing. And um, it helped me separate what was said, how I took it, you know, what's going on with me, you know, all of those what things. What about journaling? Um, I don't necessarily no. call it that, but you could, you know, you could, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I also do other things. I mean, one thing that I do a lot now, because I was told it's really great for anger, is um, legs up the wall, which is a yoga pose, and I will, go and turn myself upside down, you know, and just breathe, you know, mm. for a while. And that, it also helps me just transition from work to home. Because a lot of times that's also what's going on for me, you know, it's, I've just been at work, I've just driven in traffic, I'm now home, you know, all of those things are combined. So that's why I think, when I was talking about the separating things out, like it's never necess necessarily one thing. Something triggered stuff, but there's a lot more going on than that one thing that might have triggered. I don't know if I've answered your question. Mm -hmm. I think you have. Oh, okay. <laughs> you talk about one of the, so it brings up one of the challenges of, of um, making a living mm -hmm. and being a writer, which mm -hmm. generally doesn't have a lot to do with making a living. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you, certainly yeah, well, <laughs> you know, the, there's more money in prose, that's for sure. Yeah, there is. Uh, 
But even that's a struggle. Yeah. Uh, how do you balance between the, the, the paycheck work? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it something you love as well? or and the, uh, Yeah, the and so I will say this, because I'm pretty safe here. So. <laughs> so what I will say is the paycheck work that I do right now, the actual work with students, I love. Um, some of the decisions, some of the, but that, you know, everybody talked about, yeah, we feel the same. You know, some of the decisions that might have been made by the larger entities, mm -hmm. um, or that are outside of my control totally, I don't necessarily like, so that can be challenging. But I really do like working with students, because I'm working with students on their writing. Mm -hmm. um, and the students that I am honored <laughs> to work with, and blessed to work with, they, in general, want to change things and make whatever area they're working in, they want to make the world a better place or that field a better place. And so they're looking to do that, so I get to kind of help them by being a midwife and supporting them and listening to them you know, a lot of times and their challenges and also listening to their struggles around writing. And, it, and although the form that they're writing in may not be poetry, although some do include poetry in what they're writing, the larger pieces, um, it's still writing, you know. And so and there's still a process attached to it. There's still challenges that come up with it. There's still um, what might be called a writer's block. There, there are still deadlines. So all those things, you know, still exist. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't take away from the energy that you have. No. Uh, and, for your and, own writing. Mm -mm. As a matter of fact, I mean, I would say that it helps me in, in many ways. Because, you know, I've walked in their shoes in many ways. So um, in supporting them, I'm not just saying, oh, yeah, you should do this, or that's really nice. I, you know, <laughs> I really do understand what mm -hmm. you're going through. Yeah. It's a place of empathy. Yeah. Yeah. Who are some poets that uh, you find yourself going back to again and again? Uh, that's a good question. So let me think. Um, <laughs> You know, it changes so much all the time, but um, one person I really like because she, some of her older poems, and I can't speak to the newer ones, some of her older poems, she shape-shifted, I'll, I'll call it shape-shifted in her poems, is Joy Harjo. I just love how she so seamlessly was able to do that. Um, so I like reading, going back and reading some of her old stuff, or older stuff. Um, I really love Lucille Clifton because she, there's a simplicity to it, although I know it wasn't easy to get what she got, <laughs> you know, onto the page at all. Um, but she just goes there in that way. Um, I like so many people, it's really hard. Um, I really like, although I can't think of the volume of his that I like the most, but I like Neruda's work quite a bit. There's a sensuality to it that really blows me away every time, you know, I go back and read some of his work. Um, uh, I always come to a, a kind of stopping point here, but not really. Somebody knew that I was introduced to, and that I hadn't read any of his work. Um, let's see if I can remember. I can see is Douglas Kearney, and. His, I mean, I don't know what he's doing, but I really like it. I don't know how else to explain it. He's just, and actually he would be a person that you could consider writing in what might be called a hybrid form. He just goes, you know. Um, and he's saying some very deep things. At first you might think on the surface that, you know, he's just fooling around, but he's doing a lot more than that, you know, with his work. Um, I, I'm trying to think of any, somebody else. I recently um, have been reading, I think it's her fourth volume. I can't remember if she's done a trilogy or it's, a, it's four volumes, but Brenda Hellman, it's the Words on Fire. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like that. I like the way she blends writing about activism, aging. The themes are really wonderful, and she does some very interesting things with her work. So. Um, there are many more, but those are the four that, or five, or whoever I said, that, that kind of pop into my head right now. Maybe we have one more question. Well, it's three o'clock. I uh, think the hour is moving quickly. <laughs> Day on his beach day. And <laughs> I also have a mail.
mailing list because I do have a book that will be coming out either later this year, or we're kind of playing with it now, or in the beginning of next year. And um, I'd like to keep you, you know, updated as to when it comes out. We have, we're creating little cards that we're going to send to people. So I do have a mailing list over here. If you wouldn't mind signing it if you're interested, no pressure. But um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and there are more copies of the little booklet that I have on, stacked on the chair outside. Feel free to take some for friends if you uh, want to pass them on. Okay. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.